Yeah. Okay, um, so thanks for coming this morning. Um, for those who've been uh, away for the summer, welcome back. I'm sure you're excited to be here at Nalesis again. Um, today I'm going to be talking about a semantics-based approach to machine perception. Yeah. So can anybody tell me what this is? Yeah, it's an apple, right? So this activity of you know taking these observable properties, you know the shape, um, the color, the texture, and then deriving some conceptualization of an apple, right? So this is what we call perception, um, and people are pretty good at this naturally. And the task of um, developing techniques um, that machines can use to engage in this activity is called machine perception. So what I want to talk about today is this task of, or I want to ask the question of whether machine perception can be formalized using semantic web technologies um, in order to derive these abstractions from sensor data, and in particular using background knowledge, um, perhaps that we could find on the web. And then can we execute this on more resource constrained devices? And in particular, I'm going to address three issues. So the first is the semantic annotation of sensor data. And then I'll talk about the interpretation or abstraction of this sensor data. And then finally, the execution of these abstractions on more resource-constrained devices. But I'll begin with um, the annotation of sensor, web, of, of sensor data. And through a project we call Semantic Sensor Web. But first, I want to start with a bit of a primer on semantic web, right? So suppose we wanted to uh, allow a machine to better understand this far side cartoon. So the first thing we would do is start to label things, right? So this is a tree, this is a house, that's a dog, right? And the next thing we want to do is start providing relationships between these things. So this thing here lives in a house and has a pet, the dog. Right? And we have particular languages, like the resource description framework, to represent these kind of facts. But sometimes we also want to represent more general knowledge about these things. Right? We want to say a person can have a pet, which is of type animal. And we have other languages, like the web ontology language, to represent this kind of information. But the real power of semantic web comes when we can integrate these two different types of information together in order to extract new knowledge, new information that was not previously explicitly represented. Right? So with this information, we can derive or infer that because this thing here has a pet, it must be a person. And the dog, because it is a pet, must be an animal. Right? So this is information that was not previously represented but provides uh, a better understanding of what's going on. Right? So this is pretty powerful. And because of this, um, the semantic web has really been maturing and growing in the last few years. Right? So we're seeing this technology being used in government, in life sciences, in geographic sciences, and other things. But when I first started my PhD, um, we rec recognized that no one was really looking at how to apply this technology for understanding sensor data. So we started a project called Semantic Sensor. Tasked with developing um, technologies to represent and manage the sensor data on the web. Yeah. And one of the first things we, so we recognized is that sensor systems and sensor data is often stovepiped within organizations, right? So the same organization will buy a set of sensors, will put them out in the environment, will collect the data, will analyze the data, and then we'll use the data in some application, right? So that it, along its entire life cycle, the data is controlled by the same group, the same organization. But just like everything else on the web, we see value in setting this data free and sharing it open. But when we do that, we come across new problems. So all of a sudden, we have to start worrying about how do you discover the data? How do you access it? How do you query it? Right? How do you integrate and interpret the data when it's coming from multiple different places? 
exits. So the Open Geospatial Consortium started a project to help solve this problem called the Sensor Web Enablement. Right? And they developed um, a set of languages for representing sensor descriptions, sensor observation data. And they also developed a set of service interfaces to allow standard query um, and access to this data. Okay. So probably the most prominent service is called the Sensor Observation Service. It allows you to query for sensor descriptions and sensor observation data. And this was a good first step towards solving some of this problem. It really helped um, solve the problem of discovering the data, accessing the data, searching the data. But we found it really didn't help to in integrate the data together or interpret the data. So for that, we decided to apply some semantic technology. And along with the W3C, we started an incubator group called Semantic Sensor Networks. Right? Um, tasked with developing a standard sensors ontology and an annotation framework for helping to manage this data. So when we first began to develop this ontology, we really wanted to see what are the primary concepts and processes involved in all sensing systems, right? So there's usually a sensor involved, right? Um, the sensor interacts with some stimulus um, to derive some observable property, which is related to some object or event in the world. And then based on this interaction, it generates some observation results, usually of some measurement of value of some type. And so first we set about modeling these concepts and processes. And then we began to expand to include different modules with different aspects of sensing. Right? So how do we model systems of sensors? How do we model uh, measurement capabilities? How do we model operating restrictions? Okay? So if you have a, a wind sensor that ceases to operate correctly, after the temperature is below you know, 100 degrees Fahrenheit, how do you model these kind of things? Right? So these are some of the questions we started to ask. And as a result, we have this fairly comprehensive ontology um, that has really become the de facto standard using many projects across the web. And in addition, we developed a semantic annotation framework um, where we allowed we provided the ability to embed semantic tags, basically, into the, OG, the XML OGC languages. Right? And these tags are called what we call model references. So basically, they provide pointers to concepts um, defined within a semantic ontology. Right? So this allowed um, groups and organizations who already um, knew about the OGC technology to incorporate a bit of semantics without having to rewrite their systems. And to demonstrate the value of this technology, we developed a, a semantic sensor observation service. So this is a service that allows you to query for sensor descriptions, sensor observations. But because the data was semantically annotated, we could provide um, relationships and links to other information on the web. Right? So provide some integration and a little bit of interpretation. So as an example, on top of the um, SimSauce architecture, we developed an application that allowed you to query for sensor, sensors using named locations. Right? So you could type in Dayton International Airport, and it would you know, locate sensors in the vicinity. And this is different because previously, you always would have to put in coordinates. So who knows the coordinate of Dayton International Airport? Right? Well, very few of you probably. And we were able to do this because we had our semantic, or had our sensor descriptions semantically annotated, and we can relate them to descriptions of name locations on the web, particularly uh, within the data set called GeoNames. Yeah. So this provided a good illustration of the power of semantic annotation yeah, for sensor data. But again, it doesn't really help us understand what's going on in the world. It didn't provide any sort of interpretation or abstraction of what that sensor data was telling us. 
And for that, we developed a technology called semantic perception. So perception is this ability to take low-level sensor data and generate some representation of the external world. And if we wanted to design machines that are capable of this activity, and we wanted the machines to be able to understand the resulting representation, then we really needed a systematic formal account of how this is done. And the first thing we notice is that, as I said before, people are pretty good at this, right? And so I said about looking at cognitive models of perception to see what we can be, what can be learned. Now, I didn't want to mimic human perception in any way, but rather just to extract some good ideas that could be useful for our models. And I found three ideas of primary significance. The first is that perception is an active cyclical process. Okay. So consider how sensors traditionally work. So you take some sensors, you put them out in the environment, within, within some sampling frequency, they'll collect information. But that's very different from how you and I sense our environment. Okay. So if I hear promote clapping over here all of a sudden, I'm going to turn my head, shift my eyes, focus my attention to collect information that might be valuable. And then second, Richard Gregory came along, and he said that perception is driven by background knowledge. So we all have some preconceived notions about how the world works, and this heavily influences our perceptions. And second, he showed that this cyclical behavior can be best understood as the generation and testing of hypotheses. And then finally, Ken Norwich came along. And he said that some observations are more informative than others. So in particular, the informational value of an observation can be derived from its ability to test these hypotheses. Okay. So this last statement is not actually something Norwich ever said. This is a, an addendum that we made to his work. But we found it's useful for modeling machine perception. And so based on ideas like these, we developed a model of perception called Intellego. And it's based on two primary operators. Explanation for generating hypotheses, and then focus for testing these hypotheses. And each of these operators are driven by background knowledge. But before I get too deeply into that model, let's take a step back and consider what happens when we walk into a doctor's office. So they might take our temperature, they might take our blood pressure, and then they'll start asking us a series of questions. So I would suggest that this diagnosis activity is a perceptual act. And this perceptual act is complicated and it's expensive, right? But we can improve this activity if we can get people to be more proactive and attentive to their own health care. Not after they've gotten sick and go to the doctor, but every day. Okay. So as a good example of this, I'd like to introduce Larry Small. So he's a professor at the University of California, San Diego. And he diagnosed himself with Crohn's disease. And he was able to do this because he was very attentive and paid much close attention to his own physiology. And he did a lot of research in studying the background knowledge. Right? So we might not all have the aptitude or patience of Larry Small. But as technologists, I believe that we can encourage this kind of behavior if we can build technologies that allow people to monitor and manage their own health. And I believe we can build such applications based on three recent developments. The first is the fact that sensors are becoming cheap and ubiquitous. They're everywhere collecting everything. Um, second is the fact that we're all carrying around these little computers that can collect the data and analyze the data effectively. And finally, what might be probably the un most unappreciated recent development, at least in my opinion, is the rise of background knowledge of the web, um, especially um, as the semantic technologies are maturing. 
So based on these technologies, we can finally begin to develop technologies capable of making sense of that type of data. And this is the task of intellect. So the primary challenge we're dealing with here is to translate from this low-level sensor observation data into some higher level abstractions or situation awareness that we can use within our applications or can help us with some sorts of decision making. Yeah. And this can also be understood as the traversal through multiple levels of abstraction. So we begin with a number, um, some raw data. And then we can semantically annotate this data to say, well, this is actually systolic blood pressure data. Right? And we can use the resource description framework language to to do this. And then we can use other languages like the web ontology language to do some interpretation of this data, right? So we can set a threshold to say, well, this is actually an elevated blood pressure reading. But this is about the level of expressivity allowed with current semantic technologies. And this is what we can do with the sensors ontology. But to take it to the next level, and to take elevated blood pressure, combine it with high heart rate and perspiration levels to hypothesize the existence of hypothyroidism, that requires a, a new approach. So I'm going to begin discussion of Interlego with the explanation operator, which takes a set of observed properties and generates a set of features to act as hypotheses. So features in this case is um, just another term for objects or events. This actually comes from the geosciences stuff. And the first thing we recognize is this is an abductive process. Right? It was called inference to the best explanation. So given some background knowledge about the world, given some sensor observation data, our task is to find a set of features that can account for these sensor observations but yet it's consistent with the background knowledge. And in this case, background knowledge is represented as a, as a causal network relating the features to their observable properties. So here, um, we're representing a causal network using the sensor's ontology. So one way to read this is to say, elevated blood pressure is caused by hyperthyroidism. Okay, so we have our background knowledge encoded within semantic languages, often on the web. We have sensor data encoded within semantic languages. And so we would like to be able to define our perceptual operators also using semantic languages so we can take advantage of this. But the problem is, Al was not really defined um, to deal with abduct abduction. But we found that we can simulate certain forms of abduction if we can constrain our problem in certain ways. In particular, we can simulate an abductive logic framework called the parsimonious covering theory using the single feature assumption. So this basically means that an explanation is a single individual feature that can account for all the observed properties. So if we constrain ourselves in this way, then we can define and declare a specification in AL, and we can use an, an AL DL reasoner to compute our abductive consequences. And we found that this approach has a lot of benefits. Right? So for example, the parsimonious covering theory um, is something is anti-monotonic. So basically this means that it's capable of minimizing the explanations based on new information as it comes in. So this is very important for sensor data, since it could be streaming in new information all the time. Second, it's capable of degrading gracefully with incomplete information. And this is also very important, since we can never assume that we have all the possible observations, but yet we still want to get a result. Yeah? But on the other hand, OWL is decidable. Right? Some might say tractable, polynomial, complexity. And it's specifically designed to reason over web data. Right? 
So we really feel that this approach we've taken is a good compromise um, to find to get such benefits into us. So I'm going to walk through the model a little, um, but just to make it more palatable, I'm just going to use examples. So the first concept we define is an explanatory feature. So this is a feature that can account for all the observed properties. So if we were to observe palpitations, you know, abnormal heart rate, then we should be able to observe hypertension and hyperthyroidism as explanations. So these are the features that can account for that observed problem. Now, if we want to use this information within an application, so say we want to prescribe, prescribe some treatment for this, we probably wouldn't be content with this ambiguous set of explanations. We want to be able to choose between them somehow. So for that, we can utilize the focus mechanism to tell us what observable properties can we take advantage of to help us discriminate between these multiple explanations. And this is actually a deductive. Okay, so we want to find those observable properties that have what we call informational value, right? So these are the properties that are capable of discriminating between hypotheses. And for this, we define three concepts. The first is expected property. Right? So this is a property that is accounted for by all the explanatory features. Okay. So if we were to assume hypertension or hyperthyroidism to be the case, we would also expect to be able to observe elevated blood pressure and palpitations, right? This is expected, it's predictable. Therefore, it has no informational value, it's not discriminating. This is almost directly out of Shannon's information. Second, we just define not applicable property. This is a property that cannot be accounted for by any of the explanatory features, right? And again, this has no informational value. It's not capable of discriminating between these hypotheses. And with these two, we can define a discriminating property as a property that is neither expected nor not applicable. So therefore, is discriminating. So here we can see clammy skin is discriminating because it can be accounted for by hyperthyroidism, but not by hypertension. So in our application, this tells us that perhaps we want to go task a guy by a skin response sensor and collect some information. OK, so we've defined our declarative specification of perception using L. You know, and we want to be able to use it in some application. Okay. So we take our ontology, we download it onto a mobile device. Um, we download a now reasoner, and we begin to compute some inferences after we've hooked up some sensors. Yeah. And that's when the stark reality hits. That while in theory, you know, Al's tractable, realities may be a different story. Right? So with only a few tens of nodes in our background knowledge, concepts, um, features, and properties, we found that it would take 20 to 30 minutes to compute an inference. And then we begin to run out of resources. This is on a fairly contemporary device, a Samsung Infuse on the smartphone. So what do we do about this? Right? So to solve this problem, we, we started um, developing a technology we're now calling intelligence at the end to allow this kind of um, execution of perceptual operators on these types of devices. Now why is this important? Well, we're beginning to see the topology, the architecture, of the Internet and Web dramatically change. So no longer is it just personal computers and services, um, servers. We're seeing all types of devices being connected. Right? We're seeing you know, homes being connected. We're seeing cars being connected. We're seeing smartphones being connected. We're seeing sensors being connected. Okay? And so it's been predicted that within the decade, there's going to be 50 billion such devices connected to the internet. Yeah. So an example is the basis watch. All right, so like this. So it collects you know, heart, um, heart rate, uh, movement, skin temperature, galvanic skin response, 
And then it transmits this information to the cloud continuously. And so what we're seeing is the rise of what some are calling the homo digitus, right? So the digital person, right? So people and their physiology are actually becoming things on the web of things. And I believe this can make a real impact in healthcare. And we saw in the previous section you know, how we can begin to think about making sense of this data, interpreting this data. But now we need to begin talking about how do we do it efficiently and how do we do it at scale. So the first approach, the one most people are now taking, is to take all of that data and just send it to the cloud, let some big computers analyze the data. Right? And that's perfectly valid. But I'm not convinced that it's always the best approach. Right? Um, you know, if, for those who have worked in sensor data, they know that communication of data is always the bottleneck. And we try to restrict it as much as possible. But also, as these 50 billion low-level devices come online, wouldn't it be nice if we could begin to take advantage of some of that resource capability and do some analysis of that. So our approach was to downscale the semantic processing so that each device was capable of executing the semantic, in semantic inference, particularly the machine perception algorithms. So this idea of downscaling semantic processing, it's fairly new in semantic. Um, but already we're starting to see the emergence of several approaches. The most pr predominant is researchers are trying to find subsets of the OWL language that can be implemented and executed more efficiently on these types of devices. But for our problem, we found that these subsets were never quite expressive enough to represent the perceptual operators. So we came up with a new approach. And that was to use bit vector um, encodings in their operators to encode the semantic background knowledge and execute the perceptual inference. And the first step was to translate this background knowledge from the semantic representation into a more compact bit matrix representation. So this is fairly straightforward. The, the, prop the rows represent properties. The columns represent features. There's a 1 if there exists a causal relation between the property and feature, a 0 otherwise. And we can translate back and forth between these with no loss of information. But using this more compact representation, we can then begin to develop um, more efficient algorithms using bit vector operators. Yeah. And it's important to note here that these algorithms are what are called semantics preserved. So they will result in, they will compute the same result as an OWL reasonable. And we have proofs to this effect. So I'm not going to walk through these algorithms line by line, but rather just give an example that I hope will show the intuition behind the approach. So we begin with our background knowledge encoded within a bit matrix representation, and also a set of observed properties represented by a bit vector. So here, a property is represented with a 1 if it's been observed, a 0 otherwise. And the first step is to find a property that has been observed. So here we can see elevated blood pressure has been observed. We grab the corresponding row in the background knowledge, and we and it with a set of explanations, which is also represented by the vector. So here, um, a feature is represented with a 1 if it can explain the observed properties, a 0 otherwise. And to initialize, we start with all 1s. And we get a result. So we can see that hypertension, um, hyperthyroidism, and pulmonary edema all explain this elevated blood pressure. Right? So perhaps this isn't too interesting yet. Um, but we see that palpitations has also been observed. So we grab the corresponding row in the background knowledge, we and it with a set of explanations, and we get a new set of explanations. 
And here we see hypertension and hyperthyroidism are expanding. So this is the same result we got with the, the Alvarez. And again, as before, we're probably not going to be content with this ambiguous set of explanations. We want to discriminate between them, right? We utilize the focus effort to do that. The setup of this algorithm is fairly similar, only this time we're also using a bit vector representing discriminating properties. And this time we want to find those properties that have not yet been observed, right? So we can see clammy skin has not yet been observed. We grab the corresponding row in the background knowledge. We end it with the set of explanations. And we get a new set of explanations. And so we have to ask the question, is, it, is this property discriminated? So looking at the previous set of explanations and the current set of explanations, we can see that it obviously is. Right? So previously, hypertension was explanatory, but is no longer. But we need to be able to show this algorithmically. So the first thing we ask is, is this property expected? And to test this, we check and see if the set of explanations changed. Okay? And we can see that it did. So the property is not expected. And next, we check to see if the property is not applicable. And to test this, we check to see if the set of explanations became empty. And we see that it did not. So we can see that clammy skin is neither expected nor not applicable, and therefore it's discriminated. And again, this is the same result we got from a null reasoner, and this tells us we might want to go task this galvanic skin response. So to evaluate our approach, we set up so we set up two experiments, um, both on the Samsung infused device. So the first, on the left, um, uses an owl reasoner. Yeah. So the number on the x-axis represents the number of concepts in our background knowledge. Y-axis represents execution time. So you could see that <coughs> explanations were computed in about 1,000 seconds. Discriminators were found in about 2,500 seconds. And we're seeing cubic growth rate. But compare that with the second evaluation on the right, which uses our bit vector algorithms. So here, we're no longer working with a few tens of nodes. Rather, we're working with 10,000 nodes or concepts in our background knowledge. And execution time for both finding explanations and finding discriminators can be measured in milliseconds. And we're seeing linear growth rate. So just to summarize, our problem size was increased from tens of nodes to thousands of nodes. Our execution time was reduced from minutes to milliseconds, and complexity was reduced from polynomial to linear. So this demonstrates orders of magnitude improvement, both efficiency and scalability. Have we thought about uh, uh, putting a real number between 0 and 1 in those metrics and uh, thereby capture uh, uncertainty or approximate uh, uh, thing or probabilities? Um, what are we trying to measure as this? As on Instead of zero or one, uh, you can put some real number there. So, so some, uh, some, you know, fraction in the in the bit vectors in the you have zero or one, right? Whether it exists or does not exist. Right. Um, that would require that if you put some mm -hmm. number point eight. Yes. Um, I think that's a good approach going forward. Uh, currently, we're using you know, these binary logics. Mm. It's 0 and 1. It happened or it didn't happen. We mm. saw the property or we did not see the property. Mm. Right? So there's no intermediate. Mm. Um, moving beyond to more probabilistic logics, mm. um, of course, requires us to move beyond the expressivity of Al, um, which is perfectly fine. Um, that's not something that we have explored in this dissertation. Sure. But the only thing is that uh, to, I, I think people have looked into uh, doing uh, that with OWL, and uh, it's very really much more complicated. I'm just wondering uh, whether it will be much simpler because we are dealing with numbers and matrix operations mm -hmm. um, in the big factor mechanism. Right, so there is some early work in modeling probabilistic, like Pronto is one project. Um, 
but yeah, I think it's still early work. Um, it's, I don't think it's quite as efficient as out yet. But yeah, I think it's definitely something to look at going forward. Okay, so just to recap. Um, so we talked about the semantic sensor web technologies, um, tasked with annotating the sensor data for better representation and management of this data on the web. Based on this work, we've had some fairly good publications, I believe. Um, one early publication um, in the internet computing has really become kind of a seminal uh, work in this area. I think it's approaching 300 citations now. Um, and we were able to you know, help collaborate on a W3C um, official report. In order to derive abstractions from this data, um, we then de designed a declarative specification of perception using cognitive models of perception and capable of using an uh, LDL reason. Okay. And based on this work, um, we wrote a paper that is now seen, has now become the most downloaded paid paper in IEEE Intel Internet Computing in 2012. So people are actually paying good money to read about this stuff. You, know? you guys are getting it for free. Yeah, for 2012. And then finally, in order to execute this perceptual inference um, efficiently, we defined a set of bit vector algorithms to execute this inference on resource constrained devices. And this work has been published in the International Semantic Web Conference. This is the premier conference in semantic web community. But for sure, that's not the only um, publication and distribution of this work. Um, we've had good publications uh, related to this, these ideas in, in journals and conferences and workshops. Um, if anybody's really interested in details, you can go to my website or ask me later. Okay, so once we have the technology somewhat understood, we can, we can begin to apply it in different areas for different problems. And so we've looked into applying this technology for detecting weather events um, from some 20,000 weather stations across the U.S. We've looked in using the technology for detecting fire events um, using little robots that run around a room. But the application I'm most excited about is the ability of this technology to improve healthcare. Because we're seeing that heart disease, for example, is a major issue, accounting for 30% of all deaths in the US. And acute decompensated heart failure, this is a particularly insidious diet, affecting 6 million people. And we're seeing that hospital readmission rates for people with ADHF are extraordinarily high. 50% are readmitted within the first six months, 25% within 30 days. And this is costing the US healthcare system $17 billion a year. Right? So you can imagine that the government and hospitals are really incentivized to help solve this problem. <coughs> and the current state of the art in this area is a project called WANDA, coming out of UCLA. So this is a particular telemonitoring system that uses low-cost sensors, um, like weight scale, blood pressure monitors, aggregates this information on the smartphone and then sends it to the cloud. And Wanda also uses a particular thresholding technique. So if they find that you know, systolic blood pressure is above 90, then they can say that this is elevated, and then can contact the physician accordingly. And Wanda also uses something called the Heart Failure Somatic Awareness Scale. So this is a series of 12 questions that have been shown to be predictive of heart failure. So every day, they'll ask the patient these same 12 questions. And then they'll aggregate the result and then send it on to the physician. So you can imagine this might become <coughs> somewhat tedious. And there's no guarantee that this information is even relevant every single day. So we think we have a better approach, another approach, we call K-Health, Knowledge Enabled Healthcare, which uses our semantic perceptual inference 
along with cardiology related sensors, and background knowledge from the web that's been curated. And we use this to monitor and abstract the health conditions of patients. And importantly, we use it to ask the patient contextually relevant questions. So to enable this application, we developed a cardiology background knowledge with the help of Sujan and EZDI. And we began with a knowledge base called Unified Medical Language System. Right, so this is a large knowledge base um, that can, contains terminology and taxonomy of concepts from medicine and healthcare. Right? So from this, we extracted the concepts related to cardiology. But this knowledge base did not provide us with the causal relations we needed. So we went to healthline.com to extract this text. And as a result, we get a causal network with 284 symptoms, 173 disorders, and 1,900 causal relations. So you might recall, previously I discussed that you know, our systems was having trouble with a few tens of nodes in our background knowledge. So now we have a real system with you know, 450 concepts. And we begin with data from some sensors. So the big three in cardiology are a weight scale, a blood pressure monitor, and a heart rate monitor. Okay. And we connect this data to a mobile device through Bluetooth, which contains our KTEL software, which can take this data and then generate explanations. Okay. So we could take this data, and you know, if needed, we could send it to the physician. But we don't have to stop there. right? We can utilize the focus operator and the observable symptoms to begin to ask the patient contextually relevant questions. You know, are you feeling lightheaded? Are you having trouble taking deep breaths? So we don't have to confine ourselves to just asking the patient those same 12 questions every day, but we can choose from a much larger pool now. Right? In our system, we have 284. And using this, we can begin to narrow down the explanatory features. So the, the hypothesis is that by asking these more contextually relevant questions, um, we could provide more specific information about the patient's health, and by providing this to the physician, it will result in improved health. Yeah, and this question in your uh, discriminatory properties, you had talked about earlier discriminatory properties and explanatory properties, and here again is your observatory. How do you go from the relationship between them? So low liver properties, then you're doing abstraction for the explanatory high liver properties. And so how does, work, how does uh, the relationship work between them? Like for example, you have your lightheaded. What, what is lightheaded? Like if, we, if, uh, if you think in the numerical terms, the device is measuring, mm -hmm. or we are asking people to point out whether. I know what you mean, just a clarification. Um, properties are explanatory. Mm -hmm. Features or objects of mm -hmm. interest. But, okay, um, yes, like high blood pressure, right? Well, often there's an industry standard of what that means, maybe systolic above 90, right? And so we know this. But lightheaded, what's that, right? Very abstract thing. Um, there are some observable properties that sensors can't measure, right? But that doesn't mean we can't say something about them. Like, we're asking a person whether they're feeling lightheaded. A person can act as a sensor, too. It's a very important sensor. I can ask you whether you're lightheaded, and you can tell me yes or no. So we consider this to also be an observable property. Okay? If this information came from a sensor, a machine, then yes, you would have to develop some way of determining when it's lightheaded and when it's not. So if you remember um, Pratik Desai's thesis, or dissertation not too long ago, he kind of talked about this, um, particularly using fuzzy logics kind of talk about how these kind of integrate together. Okay, so now we want to evaluate this idea, right? We want to test the ability to discriminate between sets of potential disorders using either um, the 12 observable symptoms of the heart failure somatic awareness scale in WANDA versus the 284 symptoms um, available to k yeah. So 
So we begin with a set of all possible disorders um, known to our knowledge base, and we extract an actual disorder from an EMR document. Right? And this acts as our ground. This is a disorder we know the patient has. Right? And the task is to discriminate between these possible disorders um, using the set of um, observable symptoms to find a minimum set of explanations. Right? And we're really looking at two metrics. The first is efficiency. So how many observations, or questions in this case, is required to minimize the set of explanations? And the second, how specific is this minimum set of explanations? So how many um, features are in the set, basically? Um, Cody, can you go back one so, uh, can you please explain with some examples what exactly, so you have actual disorder, you have possible disorder, and you have explanatory disorder. All of them are disorder. What's the differentiation between three of them? Yes. Um, so, a possible disorder is all the disorders known to our knowledge base, right? So, all of the cardiology related disorders that a person can have that our knowledge base knows about. An actual disorder is a disorder that a, a, a real person in the real world has, and we extracted this information from an electronic medical record. Right? Given by a clinician. Yeah, given by a clinician. An explanatory disorder is the disorder, the, the set of disorders that we have found where we have minimized the set of all possible disorders as much as we possibly can using a set of observable symptoms, right? And so, in the best case, using this discrimination facility, we will actually converge on the actual disorder that the person has, right? But it's possible that we might not actually get that. But the actual disorder is already written by the clinician in the EMR. Yes. So what are we doing with it? The explanatory disorder? Okay. The explanatory disorder, so basically we want to see how well our system can take all of those possible disorders, filter them down, and conclude with the actual disorder that the um, physician also diagnosed the patient with. Compare. So we're evaluating the accuracy of the actual disorder written with the data? So we're, compare, we're evaluating not the, not the explanation operator. So we're not evaluating how well it diagnoses. What we're evaluating is the, the ability of the focus operator to discriminate between these possible disorders. So we're looking at how fast it can do it and how specific is the resulting set. How would you identify this? Sorry. How would you argue that is correct? Which part is correct? Uh, the uh, discrimination. How did you? Uh, how would you argue that explanatory disorder is correct? Or? Okay. So again, we're not we're not trying to validate whether the explanation operator comes up with the right result. The way we do this is we actually take the actual disorder, and in each step we try to discriminate from all possible disorders. Right. And so we basically discriminate at this point. So with everything being Right will come to the actual disorder. Right? So we're not actually testing this explanation operator, but just the focus operator to see how quickly it can do that process. Why not? Because you'll see here in a second, um, when we actually look at the EMR, there's often, um, there's often disorders that occur concurrently. Right? A person can have more than one disorder. And we don't want to evaluate the ability of our system to explain multiple concurrent disorders. So at, th at the moment, Intellego is not set up to handle that expression. Okay. So we're just evaluating the focus operator. Okay. okay, so we start with 500 electronic medical records, and we find about three disorders per electronic medical record. And we have about 173 possible disorders in our knowledge base. Just a quick question, Cody. So the 
victims are 496 uh, distinct patients, or uh, there might be multiple EMR records per patient? Um, we don't know that. <coughs> um, we're not able to actually check to see whether, um, for each visit, a new EMR will be created, but we don't know who the patient is. Okay, so in the first experiment, we test um, the heart failure somatic awareness scale, and we find that it can converge to a minimum set of explanations, um, on average with seven and a half questions. And this minimum set of explanations contains about 12 features. Okay. And heart failure somatic awareness scale converges to the one actual disorder about 20% of the time. In our second experiment, K-Count, we found that it can um, find the minimum set of explanations with about 7.3 questions, but yet always converges to the actual disorder. Right? So this is perhaps a simple experiment, but we think it's beginning to demonstrate the value um, of using K-Health um, in Interlego within um, the healthcare domain. What, why, why is the efficiency improvement not much at all? Well, notice that we're actually going a lot farther. So they had to stop at oh, okay. 12, mm -hmm. which means they can't do anymore. Whereas camp does move beyond that. Mm -hmm. uh, so that might take a couple of more iterations. Actually, what is surprising is that it is actually the same. Because when you have a lot more questions, right, you would expect it to actually take significantly more than seven. And the fact that seven itself leads you to one is actually a very interesting uh, observation. Yeah, the point here is that the uh, efficiency measure is, is not very really accurate here. Uh, it should be efficiency per reduction in uh, uh, explanation or something along that line. That's a good idea. We should be kind of a more single number that can compare. Yeah, you can com yeah, no, you yeah. can't can compare that in the sense that uh, the outcomes are different here. So. Um, uh, how much, like, you know, you kind of think of a funnel, and their funnel comes, you know, ex halfway, and we, you know, you go down all the way uh, to the end, so you have a lot more thing to go through, and you need to be able to capture that. So, for the reduction, you know, you want to compute efficiency in terms of the, what it takes to reduce from all the possible set of explanations to the level of explanations you can get. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can compute. I'm not going to do it like now, but we can do it. Okay. So we're still holding out hope that you know, we'll be able to put this work into preclinical trials um, at some point in the near future, along with our partners at Ohio State University. Um, along with Ohio State, I've also had you know, the great pleasure to work with some fantastic researchers across the world. Um, I did internships at the University of Melbourne uh, in Cairo in Australia. Um, fantastic experience, wouldn't trade it for anything. Um, also working with the Defense Intelligence Agency in the Office of Measurements and Signature Intelligence. It was an interesting experience. Um, and of course I had the fantastic pleasure of working with the brilliant and talented researchers at the University of Surrey. I know Promote's going to have a nice visit over the next couple of months. Um, especially I'd like to thank uh, AFRL and Daxi. So they funded a lot of this research early on, and they were very supportive of these ideas. Um, so I'm thankful for that. And definitely I'd like to thank my committee. Um, I'll thank you know, each of you properly, individually, because I'm not sure if I can, you know, will fully and succinctly express my gratitude for everything that I've learned over these last few years. Um, I really think I'm a better person because of it. For you know, the members of Noasis, you know, if I have any advice to give, I guess it would just be you know, to keep calm and carry on. You know? <laughs> so this is a, a long, arduous process. You know, so you got to work hard. Um, but try not to stress too much. 
and try to find a way just to enjoy the ride. You know? And especially I'd like to thank the Semantic Sensor Web team. Um, not everybody could be here today. There were, most of them are off on bigger and better things. Um, but those who are here, um, Hamoud, Sujan, I really appreciate your hard work and support. And I couldn't have asked for a better team than this. Thank you. Problem being recorded, you are welcome to ask questions now. We can also turn on the camera, turn off the camera if your problem being recorded. <laughs> All right. It's open for everyone. What happens when not all of your explanations? I have the thing, a, a knowledge base that I would like to use to explain various perceptions, but we know a priori that this knowledge base is woefully incomplete. We know that the actual cause, probably 50% of the time, is not there. But we'd like to be able to say, oh, but this, this one that we do happen to have is a good candidate cause. You know, so I've got, you know, I've, I'm, I'm looking at, I have uh, blood samples and the amounts of various chemicals in the blood, and I have an incomplete list of metabolic processes in the body. And I want to say, oh, process X explains what happened in this sample. Mm -hmm. But I know that, that, there's, that my database does not contain half of the metabolic processes. So we've come across some of this, um, the same issue. Right? So having, for this type of system, having a good background knowledge is crucial. Like I said, this is the driving force behind our perceptions, right? Um, our knowledge bases were vetted. I mean, we would extract them from the web, but they were also vetted by cardiologists. But we also found when we were trying to derive explanations, often they didn't match what we thought it would be. And it was because there was gaps, holes in our knowledge base. So we actually came up with a very interesting application of this intellecto, where we could take a set of EMR extract the disorders from the EMR, and then try to compute explanations. And by comparing um, the use of the background knowledge in Toledo with what was actually going on in the EMR, then we could actually see precisely where those holes are, because we had this gold standard to look at. Okay? So then we used some statistical techniques to find you know, what concepts were involved most of the time when these holes were found, and by ranking them in certain ways, we can find which ones were most likely, what relationships were most likely to be causal but were not in our knowledge base. And then we could take that, go ask some physicians, and say, hey, are we right about this or not? Right? So you can't ask the physician, just tell me everything you know, you have to be very specific, right? Um, so I don't know about your precise um, case, but think about that, finding a gold standard, Applying the techniques and looking at it and seeing if you can spot more precisely where those gaps are occurring. At least I'll give you a starting point to look at. Satya, if I'm, you guys have. I'm not trying to get the, the sense of the question. Basically, you're saying that these conditions evolve um, in certain ways, 
And um, we somehow need to capture that. Isn't it mechanism at the moment doesn't have any history? Right. How can we add a history mechanism to it, or with the multiple states? Because what you do as a reasoning at the moment is it's just single state. You get the observations, and you do your reasoning as ad hoc reasoning or a different model, and you give a result. Mm -hmm. Right. But can you make it a multi-stage type of reasoning? Then you move from state A to state B, state B to C, till you get to a cause or to a conclusion. Right. Um, I think we've, we've looked at similar ideas. Because um, basically, these disorders, um, it's not always, it doesn't always fit well um, within this bipartite graph knowledge base structure that we've developed. Right? So one disorder can lead to another disorder, which can lead to another disorder. Right? So the first thing you have to start thinking about is how do we expand this causal network beyond just the bipartite graph structure? And then once you do that, um, the, the reasoning mechanisms are going to change, and you're going to have to adapt them for that. Um, so the question is, can we do this within you know, this binary logic framework? Um, perhaps. I mean, this is something we'd have to think about more deeply. Um, along with you know, Dr. Shaw's question before, I think a lot of this information, if you want to keep, you know, past history and prior observations take these into account. We want to go more towards the probabilistic inferencing. Um, that might be a good approach as well. I think that history can anyway also be curated and added to uh, your knowledge base and you can rerun your reasoning or your rules uh, to get new uh, results. I think that might be one way, uh, and that will not be constrained by the binary uh, logic approach that you're using right now. Perhaps. Maybe if we can take this past history, um, the disorders they have, and treat them almost as observable properties. Right? So I observed that the previous disorder the person has was, you know, uh, myocardial infraction. And this is an observation that I actually use to derive a new set of expl explanatory features. Um, that's possible. Uh, well, what happens if in your reasoning model you miss some of this observation? Because now you have a set of observations and a set of disorders. And then you, you check and see what, what basically appears in, in based on observations. You decide on an abstractive but uh, a reasoning. So now what happens if some of the things are crucial for that kind of reasoning is not observed? It doesn't mean it doesn't exist. You don't know this data. Um, do you mean, okay, so if it hasn't been observed, then our system um, will still compute a correct set of explanations. It will just not be as specific as it would have been if you did observe that property. Right, so as I said before, you know, we, we can, because of it's an abductive logic framework with parsimonious curving theory. It degrades very nicely with incomplete information. So you'll always get a result. The question is how specific is that result? And with more information, we'll always get more specific uh, results. So one thing that I When you are identifying these risk making properties, I know formal concept analysis, theory, and dating of statistics will allow you to build um, formal concept hierarchies, and that there's a huge amount of work to identify which are the risk making properties that can help you classify different objects and then pick it a concept hierarchy. Mm -hmm. So the question is uh, how or does uh, your approach? Uh, have any overlap with that using, you know, spin vector is just the optimization approach. But the use of these discriminating features and the discriminatory features uh, with respect to what's already there in formal concept analysis, what's the overlap? I'm not very clear about that. Mm. So I I'm not sure if I can answer completely about this formal concept analysis. I have to look into that a bit more carefully. Um, 
I mean, I can talk a bit about um, these discriminating properties. So currently, we, when we do find a set of explanations we want to discriminate between, then we can segment this set into, into two, um, we can basically take the set and segment into two, right? So those features that can account for this new discriminating property and those that can't. Um, but that's a very coarse segmentation, right? Either they do or they don't. Um, we have experimented with the use of machine learning technologies um, to do a better job at determining not only which property segment the set, but which ones segment the set best based on the previous observations. Right? So we ran some experiments um, using, machine, using a representative training set and machine learning algorithms to actually define decision trees, which will tell you not only is a property discriminating, but which discriminating property would be most efficiently observed to um, segment the set more efficiently. Are you able to group it back? Because what you just described sort of reminds me what uh, Tofel was also working on. Right? So, but can you use what you're identifying in terms of discriminating features to influence or inform uh, the formable models that you build for a particular domain? For example, if you identify discriminating features for disease in k can you go back and add it to the concepts, whatever you have derived from your test? and enrich that with this new information you are getting because you have now access to real data from EMR or the sensor data, etc. Yeah, so we did that with um, weather data, right? Um, and we ran some experiments from, you know, these, uh, I can't remember, we had data from 20,000 weather stations. I can't remember exactly how many we used in the experiments. But we found that we can actually detect weather events um, using only half of the number of available observations. Right? So this was actually significant savings with this approach. So with not only knowing which ones are discriminating, but annotating them with um, this decision tree structure to say, well, you know, after you've seen this set of observations, this is the next one that you should observe more efficiently. Um, that is most interesting. And uh, maybe, I mean, it doesn't uh, I didn't maybe catch it through your presentation, but I think that's one aspect uh, that needs to be uh, prominently highlighted in the pieces that we have because I think that's an important application. So, yeah, I discussed this in my dissertation. Um, this is actually far beyond the capabilities of semantic languages and OWL and those kind of things. And that was kind of the focus of what I talked about today. Um, but of course, that's not all we did. So, yeah, that, that work is definitely talked about in the dissertation. Okay, guys, anything else? Remarkably. All right, well, then you guys uh, can 